students who will be doing the research for Lorica undergraduate research internship at the State of West Virginia. They are mostly involved in undergraduate research. To introduce our speaker, Ms. Megan Kirchner, who is the Director of Career and Leadership Development and the inaugural Dean of Vocation and Development here at our college. genetics. Um, Hannah plans uh, to pursue a profession in pharmaceutical sales. So, Sandy, welcome. Hi, so as mentioned before, my name is Sandy. I'm a senior here at Bethel, and I did my research over the antimicrobial effects of black pepper, garlic, and thyme essential oils on human pathogens. So earlier in the fall, I also presented a little preview of my research, and you may have forgotten about it because the KSC doesn't smell like essential oils anymore, but it definitely smells like formaldehyde. So a little bit of the background of my research and the reason why I chose to do this study is because I have a fear of bacteria and then antibiotics separately. However, when you put them together, you get antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is 10 times more terrifying in my eyes. So the increased use of antibiotics has created antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is just bacteria that doesn't respond to antibiotics. The answer to this public health crisis is to not use more antibiotics, but instead to find an alternative. And I think essential oils could be a potential alternative. So some examples of antibiotic resistant bacteria is MRSA, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, multidrug resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis, and then CRE gut bacteria. So the reason why I wanted to give examples of antibiotic resistant bacteria is because it is common. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about MRSA, and MRSA is common in healthcare settings such as hospitals, and that is kind of an area that I want to be working in. So that's why it's important to me, and it may be important to you as well. So why did I choose essential oils? Well, essential oils are natural extracts with low adverse effects that may become reliable alternatives to antibiotics, as they contain cytotoxic effects due to their complex structures and compounds, such as terpenes, terpenoids, phenols, and alkaloids. It's also believed that bacteria cannot develop resistance to botanicals as a natural extract protects the pathogenic survival. So overall, essential oil sounds fairly promising to me. The first essential oil that I looked into was black pepper essential oil. Black pepper has been used as an alternative medicine for thousands of years to treat flus, muscle aches, and arthritis. Black pepper is regarded as an effective natural antiseptic due to its strong antibi antibacterial components such as alpha-canine, beta-canine, limonene, beta-carotene, and Specific compounds are active components that lead to the disruptions of natural molecule synthesis, such as DNA, RNA, protein, and polysaccharides. 
and can rapidly destroy cell membranes for mobility, causing the cell to lie. And then an important component that is found within all these essential oils is hydrophobicity. Hydrophobicity enables the oils to diffuse through the lipids, through the lipids of the bacterial cell membrane. Once the oil has passed the cell membrane, it has the ability to disrupt the cell structures and make them more permeable and susceptible to essential oils. The next oil that I looked into was thyme essential oils. So Asian, Asian countries have taken advantage of medicinal properties of plants and incorporated them into their mainstream medicine, including thyme. The two most important components of thyme oil include thymol and carbacol, which largely affects a wide range of microbes. Thyme is used as an herbal medicine to treat alopecia, dental plaque, bronchitis, bronchitis, cough, inflammatory skin disorders, and gastrointestinal distress. Thyme has become one of the most popular medicinal plants because of its biological and pharmacological properties. Thyme oil and thyme oil have shown antibacterial, antimicrobial, and anti-inflammatory effects. When thyme oil penetrates the outer layer of the cell membrane, it causes the membrane to become more elastic and disturb the lipid bio. This ultimately leads to cell death through the rapid flow of intracellular components. Thyme oil disorganizes the cellular structure, and this leads to the de denaturation of essential enzymes due to its phenolic compounds and antimicrobial action. So basically, how thyme oil and carbacol work, work is that it disrupts the cell membrane and causes the leakage of intracellular materials, which leads to cell death. For a more visual effect of this or representation, it's kind of like if you took a knife that represents essential oil and you stab it to your abdomen and you pull it down and all your organs fall out. That's kind of like how the cell dies, but like in cell and not in human form. And then finally, I use garlic essential oil. And I know, I did not expect for it to smell that bad and that the whole KSC would smell like garlic, but I chose it because of its amazing properties and not for its smell and here's why. <laughs> so garlic has been used for a really long time for not only food purposes, but also medicinal purposes. Garlic has been used to treat prophylaxis of bacterial infections and for the treatment of various pathogens. Garlic has been proven to contain anti antioxidant properties and antimicrobial effects against bacteria, fungi, and viruses. The main component that is found within garlic oil is allicin, azones, and flavonoids, which are sulfur content phytoconstituents that diminish the activity of carcinogens and reduce the risk of cancer. These properties grant garlic essential oil the ability to be a common remedy for common diseases such as the cold, influenza, snake bites, and even hypertension. However, the most prevalent property of garlic extracts are the anti multi drug resistance and anti biofilm activities, and this is why I chose garlic. So, multi drug resistant bacteria and formation of bacterial biofilm reduces the effectiveness of antibiotics and renders them ineffective. Biofilms are formed by bacteria and extracellular components of the bacteria that can create a barrier between bacteria and then the disinfectants or antibiotics. They are the one cause of bacterial drug resistance as they block the entry of antibiotics and disinfectants into the bacteria. Garlic oil has been proven to, prove, has been proven to destroy cellular structures by penetrating cells and their organelles. So basically, biofilms are a source of antibiotic resistance. They are kind of like a shell that the bacteria create that doesn't allow antibiotics or disinfectants to pass through the membrane, which makes them useless. So this is a key reason as to why when you are prescribed antibiotics that you complete the full course, because if you don't, bacteria is really smart and then it learns more about the antibiotics and could potentially create biofilms that would render them antibiotic resistant bacteria. So in this study, I used two of the most common um, pathogens found in the human body, E. coli and S. areas. So E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria that is found within the intestinal flora, water, vegetables, and undercooked meats and soils, and etc. It's commonly the cause of urinary tract infections, and it's the primary bacteria that is found in abdominal and pelvis infections. The primary cause of E. coli resistance to antibiotics is found within the extended spectrum beta lactam Organisms that harbor this enzyme are resistant to multiple different drugs. So beta-lactams is the most prominent cause of antibiotic resistance among gram-negative bacteria as it has produced productions and mutations of beta-lactamases. Antibiotic inactivation is caused by hydrolysis, redox process, group transfers, and etc. 
So for example, hydrolysis can cause antibiotic inactivation as antibiotics have chemical bonds such as amides and esters which are hydrologically susceptible. So, so enzymes such as extended spectrum beta lactamases target these bonds and cleave them. And then the next bacteria that I used was the gram-positive bacteria S. aureus, which has a cocci shape, also known as the grape cluster, that can be found in communities and hospitals. Um, treating S. aureus is challenging as multi-drug resistant strains are rapidly emerging. S. aureus is found, is found in environments such as the human flora, located on the skin and mucous membranes and healthy individuals. Um, MRSA, which as I mentioned before, is a strain of S. aureus, that carries a gene known as the MEC gene on the bacterial chromosome. This component of the Staphylococcus chromosomal cassette MEC. The MEC cassette confers multiple antibiotic resistant properties. So in summary, Bay lactams is the cause of a lot of antibiotic resistance in gram negative bacteria, while um, the MEC gene causes antibiotic resistance in a lot of positive, gram positive bacteria. So for my hypothesis, I had so the first one was there will be a decrease of bacterial growth on all tested plates um, with an increase of oil, essential oil concentration, there will be a decrease in bacterial growth. And then my third one was gram negative bacteria will be more resistant to essential oil variants while gram positive bacteria will be more sensitive. So my materials and methods, the method that I used was the curvy bar disk diffusion methods. But before I get into that, um, the essential oils that I used were all GCMS, which stands for gas chromatography mass spectrometry, tested by the manufacturer to ensure their authenticity and purity. And then once I got the essential oils, I then filtered them through a PTFE syringe filter to remove any leftover particles that could possibly be in there. And then my oils were diluted to the concentrations of 100%, 50%, and then 25% using DMSO, which is for dimethyl sulfoxide. I use DMSO because it's an or inorganic substance that is suitable for the dilution of oils. And then I used a Kirby bar disk diffusion method. This is a little summary photo of it, um, which essentially where you put an antibiotic disk on a plate inoculated with bacteria. I spread 200 microliters of bacteria on each plate, and then you measure the zone of inhibition after 24 hours. And then the ring where there's no bacterial growth is the zone of inhibition. So it is represented as A, B, and C as the antibiotic disc that I soaked in various concentrations of essential oils. Um, and then I put them on a plate that I covered in bacteria. And then the zones, which is the white part around B and C, those are the zones, and that's what I measured to represent the antimicrobial effects. Um, in this study, E. coli was inoculated in LB auger, and then S. areas was inoculated in brain heart infusion auger plates. And this was just the material that was best suitable for their growth. So originally, I started off my experiment using four discs per plate. Um, as you can see here, there isn't clear zones on this plate. It's just one big blob. And then like the margins over here that I kind of outlined, that's where bacterial growth is. But I couldn't get a clear zone because there just wasn't the antimicrobial effect is just so big that I, it didn't leave a circle. So this happened on garlic and thyme plates, but not on black pepper plates. So what I did with garlic and thyme was I just redid the experiment using one zone, and then I measured the zone of inhibitions using the disc, the antibiotic disc, as the center of the zone, and this is how I measured it. And then I just took all of my results and I averaged the size of the zone of inhibitions. So here on these two graphs, the top one is gram negative, the E. coli, and then the bottom graph is Staphylococcus aureus, which is gram positive. Um, the NA is because th this result is from my plates with four antibiotic plates. So I'm just focused on black pepper. So here you can see that with a decrease in oil concentration, there was an increase in the size of the zone of inhibitions, which was surprising to me, and that happened on both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria for black pepper. Um, and then the NAs are just the big blobs that I couldn't calculate. So I went ahead and did this again using garlic and thyme, which is a single place. But here it shows the opposite of what happened to black pepper, where an increase of concentration resulted in an increase of the size of the zone 
adenovation, which means that there's like a greater zone, which is more antimicrobial effects. And so my results in regards to my hypothesis, the first one was supported. There was a decrease of bacterial growth on all tester plates. Um, my second one was partially supported with an increase of the central oil concentration, there will be a decrease in bacterial growth. Um, this was true in garlic and thyme, but however, it was not true in black pepper because with a decrease of concentration, there was an increase of bacterial growth for that. And then my third hypothesis was gram-negative bacteria will be more resistant to essential oils, while gram-positive bacteria will be more sensitive. That was not supportive. Um, as you can see, it happened in all of the plates. But when you look back, so the top one, the zone of inhibition was bigger for gram negative than it was for gram positive. So that's how I got that. And then some limitations of my research is that, well, there are many factors that could influence the results that we should look at before we see essential oils in clinical settings, such as extraction methods, microbial strains, microbial tests, and then the quality and environment that the plants are grown in. So when we extract essential oils from the plants, um, we don't want to lose any of the compounds found within it, so that's why we have to take a deeper look into the extraction methods of the plants. And then we also have to find a way to standardize how we grow the plants, because obviously the nutrients in which the soil, the nutrients in the soil that the plant grows in affects the potency of the oils. So before we see them in clinical settings, we have to figure out a way to standardize all of that. Um, another thing that could affect my results was that the oils that I used didn't come from the same manufacturer. The manufacturers didn't have all three that I chose, so I had to find them from different manufacturers, and that could affect my results as well, and that's something that I could look into. And then another thing that we have to look into before seeing them into clinical settings is batch to batch control, which is crucial. And this could have also um, affected my research as well. So batch to batch control is how we ensure that there's the same amount in every dose that is given. So how we ensure that, that there has to be the same amount of components in the oils per dose that is given before we can see it in clinical settings. Because too much or too little of something could have adverse effects. For example, um, in garlic essential oils, I mentioned allicin. If too much of allicin is ingested, it can have adverse effects such as nausea, vomiting, and overall feeling of sickness. So that's what we don't want. So that's why I have to take a deeper look into essential oils and how to manage them and how to make them more standardized. So finally, in my discussions, essential oils do possess antimicrobial properties, um, but further research is needed to understand the mechanisms and the pharmacokinetics and batch to batch control before we can see essential oils in a clinical setting. In my eyes, this research was kind of like the first step when it comes to using essential oils as an alternative to antibiotics. There isn't a whole lot of research that talks about using essential oils as an alternative, but I think it's worth looking into considering these results. Um, for instance, I would love to see how essential oils would affect our gut health because traditional antibiotics wipes out a bunch of our healthy gut bacteria. So I'd like to see how essential oils used as an antibiotics would um, affect that and the benefits and the comparisons of essential oils and antibiotics. So I have a lot of people to acknowledge. Um, first are my minions and the tutors that I use for my lit review, Madison Bliss, Gabby Fields, Anna Ranzinger, Sophia Chandamo, Ali Weaver, and Julian Ashog. They helped a lot with my lit review, proofread it. I'm not a, a very good writer, um, so I really took them all to work. Um, I would love to thank my amazing advisor, Fran. She helped me through so much. I was not the best student at the beginning of the year, so she really had to like pull me back into it to finish off my research. I would also like to thank Katie Lehman. She helps me with the filters. I would also like to thank um, two of my sisters, Candy Dow and Shayla Dow. Um, they both helped me a lot on my lit review and in the lab. And then I would also like to thank Noah Stanton. He came in, he's not a biology major, he does nothing with science, but he came in and he helps me in the lab as well. And then I would also like to thank the Eureka Committee because they helped fund this experiment. And then here are some of my references and sources. And I think questions are hard to understand.
was over a view of population genetics of sea turtles. The three questions I went over are what is a population uh, what is population genetics and why is it important to sea turtles? What are factors that affect population genetics of sea turtles? And then what is the current population of genetics of sea turtles? Um, what is a population? A population is a set of individuals of the same species that occupy the same vicinity that may interbreed with one another. Um, for a gene, so I kind of define a couple of things. A gene is a, a, a specific sequence of nucleotides in DNA or RNA that is located typically on a chromosome and that is a functional unit of inheritance, controlling the transmission and expression of one or more traits. By specifying the structure of a specific polypeptide and specifically a protein or controlling the function of a different genetic material. Um, so the difference between a gene and a trait, um, a trait is a specific characteristic of an organism and traits can be determined by genes or the environment or commonly by the interactions between them. The genetic combination of a trait is called a genotype and the outward expression of the genotype is called a phenotype. Um, population genetics is a discipline of biology that researches the genetic composition of biological populations and the adjustments in genetic composition that result from the operation of various factors. Population genetics is involved with the extensive genetic variation inside of a group of individuals and changes in that variation over time. Genetic variation refers to a variety of gene frequencies. Genetic variation can confer with variations among individuals or variations among populations. Um, mutations are the ultimate supply of genetic variants. However, mechanisms including sexual reproduction and genetic drift may contribute to it as well. Um, geneticists examine genetic variation by determining allele frequency and genotype frequency. Genotype frequency is the frequency that, of three possible genotypes that may arise in a specific population. They are the homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, and heterozygous genotype. The allele frequency is the frequency of the two types of a specific allele in a, in a population. So alleles are recessive and dominant, and we all know like if you have a dominant and a recessive gene kind of showing together, the dominant is going to overrule that. And that's where allele frequency and genotype frequency are a little different because allele frequency is just paying attention to if it's dominant or recessive, where genotypes are looking at if it is completely recessive, and if it's heterozygous, or if it's completely dominant. Um, the origins of population genetics. So from right, left to right, this is R.A. Fisher, C. Wright, G.S.B. Halden. Um, the discipline of population genet genetics came to the forefront of the 1920s and 1930s due to the work of these guys. Their success was to integrate the principles of Mendelian genetics and Darwinian natural selection. Many of early Mendelians did not accept Darwin's gradualist account of evolution, believing as an alternative that no novel adaptations have to arrive in a single mutational set. Conversely, many of the early Darwinians did not agree with Mendelian inheritance frequently because of the erroneous no notion that it is incompatible with the process of evolutionary modification as defined by Darwin. Uh, this is Darwin, and that is um, Gregor Mendel. Um, by working out mathematically the effects of selection, uh, acting on a population, obeying the Mendelian rules of inheritance, Fisher and Handel and Wright confirmed that Darwinism and Mendel uh, Mendelism uh, were not only just compatible, but worked fantastically together. This played a key role in the formation of the Neo-Darwin synthesis and explains why population genetics came to occupy such a pivotal position in evolutionary theory. So this is the Hardy-Weinberg guys that have started the theorem um, and it's a focus of population genetics mostly. 
Uh, the theorem summarized is that allele frequencies stay the same if the populations exist under certain conditions. These conditions are no mutation within the population, no migration that is taking place, mating is random, and there's no natural selection. Each gene generally has um, alleles, usually in diploid organisms, one from every parent. These alleles are known as recessive and dominant forms, and these are represented by P and Q. So if you see P and Q plus one, that means that you're just counting how many dominant uh, alleles are in the population and how many recessive alleles, and then you're trying to make it into about 100%. Um, and so the second equation is uh, more about the genotype frequency. So the P2 is representing all the dominant homozygous um, alleles. The P, P, no, 2 PQ is the heterozygous genotype, and then Q2 is the homozygous recessive genotype. Uh, population genetics. The study of population genetics science pursues analysis through a developing abstract models of gene frequency dynamics and seeking to extract conclusions from those models concerning the pro probable patterns of genetic variation in actual populations and testing the conclusions in opposition to empirical information. There are two varieties of models. There's deterministic and stochastic. Deterministic models are based on the approximation of infinitely large population size. And the stochastic models describe the probabilistic methods in a finite length of populations. So, why is population genetics important to sea turtles? Well, we need to understand the popula uh, population dynamics to kind of get an idea of where the population is at in size. But also, this whole um, population genetics is really used for conservation and understanding um, how endangered these species are. Um, some of them are very critically endangered, um, and then some are still endangered. So we have to uh, figure out ways to do better methods to keep them, uh, their populations growing and genetically diverse, because that shows health in a population. So factors to consider when researching population genetics. Um, so there's genetic variation, and then there's types of genetic variation. So mutations don't, do not generate a significant amount of genetic variation within, within and among the population because of low inheritance rates um, in most species. Large sources of genetic variation are known as natural selection, genetic drift, migration, non-random mating, and other sources of variation. Natural selection is a process that modifies allele frequencies from one generation to the next based on fitness, and fitness is based on reproductive success. Genetic drift occurs when allele frequencies change due to random fluctuations in population. The bottleneck effects in the founder effect are two types of genetic drift. The bottleneck effect, uh, the bottleneck effect occurs when a population has a drastic decline, usually due to natural disasters. When the population declines, the genetic diversity of the population increases as well. The founder effect occurs when a few of the individuals from a population migrate away from that population. Um, and then these individuals get extremely isolated and their allele frequency drastically declines. Migration can change allele frequencies by reducing allele frequencies from the population that they came from. So like if a turtle were to go, and they're in their one population, and they decide to migrate to another one, they're taking away that allele frequency, but then they're adding it to that new population. Um, Non-random mating happens with a probability that individuals in a population will mate is not equal for all possible pairs of individuals. Non-random mating can take the form of interbreeding and outer breeding. Interbreeding is, which is most common results when individuals are more likely to mate with close relatives than with distance relatives. Outbreeding, which is less common, is when individuals are more likely to mate with distant relatives than close relatives. Interbreeding changes genotype frequencies, not allele frequencies. Other sources of variation are exon shuffling by eukaryotes and horizontal gene shifts 
and changes in microsatellites. The number of sea turtles has recently been estimated to be about 6.5 million individuals in the wild. The seven species of sea turtles that inhibit the world embody a variety of ecological niches, such as the coastal carnivores, the loggerheads, and the Kemp Ridleys, the oceanic leatherbacks, and olive ridleys, and the sponge consuming hawkbills, and the herbivorous, herbivorous green turtles. And then the last thing there is the flatbacks, but they're a little bit different because they um, aren't completely around in the ocean lake. All other six species are found everywhere in the oceans. This one is found specifically in Papua New Guinea and in Australia. Uh, Loggerhead turtles also have an unknown population size. In Florida, there are about 20,000 nesting females, and in Omen, there are about 13,000 nesting females. Kim Ridley's and flatback turtles, uh, each with a very small dis distribution, may have around 10,000 individuals left of their species, species which is critically endangered. Um, leatherback population estimation is also unknown. However, the U.S. sees about 40 nesting females a year, and the Caribbean locations see about 1,000 nesting females per population. Um, all of Ridley tur turtles are the most plentiful of the sea, uh, sea turtles, uh, with an estimation of 2 million turtles for the population um, size in the world, and then hawkbill turtles um, varies from 83,000 to possibly 57 um, individuals, 57,000 individuals left on Earth. There is still a little known about the population size of green turtles. However, green turtles have two large nesting sites in Costa Rica and Australia. The estimation of nesting females is 22,500 in Costa Rica, and the estimation of nesting females in Australia is 18,000. Effects on populations um, that like really hurt these guys are fisheries by bycatch, so that's Probably the one when I was in Mexico, I saw a whole bunch of like turtles come up to the beach to die, uh, especially during the day. And what would happen is they get caught in these uh, nets, and then they're severely injured, and then they come up and they like rest on the beach, and then they pass away. Um, another big thing is pollution, especially plastic pollution and microplastics. Um, they found that there was they've been finding microplastics in the stomach of leatherback turtles since 1968. Um, coastal development regions and light pollution really disorient these guys from nesting, so then they get confused and they don't nest, or they aren't nesting in the same area, so it's even harder to count, and therefore it's hard to see what the conservation efforts are doing if they can't get them um, to come back. And then they can, a lot of people consume the eggs of um, these sea turtles, Actually, that was something that we had to fight also in Mexico. Um, that's kind of why we were taking them out of their nests is because um, looters will take them and I don't blame them. I mean, like, you're trying to get your money and, and like, trying to feed your family. Um, however, because they're looting hundreds of eggs at a time, this um, really affects the population as well. And then people also hunt the actual turtles uh, for their carapaces um, for crafts such as jewelry, um, and other things. And then global warming, especially with um, weather, it's really disturbing nesting sites as well as getting the nesting season right on track. So, population dynamics. Okay. And understanding of population dynamics is needed to evaluate the valuability of migratory species. Observations of marine turtles at research grounds may notice changes in population trends that can take many years to be visible at nesting beaches. Long distance migrations from breeding and foraging grounds, differential use of neuretic, oceanic, and terrestrial habitats throughout life stages, and divergent patterns among populations require researchers to creatively expand a huge range of strategies to answer even seemingly straightforward questions for these threatened and endangered species. Marine turtles migrate across lengthy dis distances, showcase complex life histories, and occupy habitats that are tough to observe. 
These factors present a significant challenge to understand essential aspects of their biology and assessing human impacts, many of which are crucial for the effective conservation of these threatened and endangered species. Um, the life cycle of a turtle. Um, the life cycle of a turtle is the generalized life history of a sea turtle consists of stages between hatching and sexual maturity, um, similar to juvenile and subadult. Baby turtles or hatchlings start off as eggs that are laid in nests on the seashores across the world. Once ready to, ha to hatch, they escape from the egg with an egg tooth, referred to as a car uncle. As young or juvenile turtles, they head out to the sea, and some turtles go to the sargrass zone to feed and grow. It also like really hides them from predators, um, and this is kind of in I think I read in the Atlantic, and it's where kind of all the seaweed converges, and it gives them a good hiding place because no predators were really there, um, which is a big factor for hatchlings and death rates. Um, hatchlings die, they say that for every thousand hatchlings, there's only one that survives, and so there is lots of different things that can cause this, but one of the biggest is predatory um, uh, predators. Once they're fully grown, they head back to where they had been born to mate. The average sexual maturity um, varies. Leatherbacks are 7 to 13 years. Both species of Ridley's are 11 to 16. Hawkbills are 20 to 25. Loggerheads are 20 to 35. And green sea turtles are 26 to 40 years. This also makes it super hard for people that are working on conservation because they don't know if the conservation efforts are necessarily working because they won't show up on the beach upwards to 40 years. So, um, there is some issues with counting sea turtles. Um, oceanic species only come up to the top when needing to nest. It can only count females in a population since the males never really emerge. Females can lay multiple nests in one season or not at all, and sometimes they have a passing period of two to six years. And then hatchlings are hard to count due to survival rates because if we were to catch all the hatchlings and then count them and then send them out, um, it, like again, like I said, one out of every thousand survives, so it'd be hard to kind of keep up with those um, numbers. All right, and then we're gonna go over the popul population genetics of these sea turtles. So loggerheads have a low M2DNA, which means that they, uh, their maternal DNA has low diversity, which means that they usually have a, one mother or one um, maternal line, where parental diversity is high. Um, that means that the males are frequently uh, Females can get pregnant by multiple males, and then they can kind of choose, pick and choose like what sperm they kind of want to put in their eggs. And so when they lay those eggs, um, they're showing high paternal diversity but low maternal diversity. Um, Kemp, Ridley, Kemp Ridley's population is actually relatively um, stable and has a pretty equal gene flow. Leatherbacks have a moderate uh, male gene flow but not female for the flatback sea turtles. Um, all of Ridley has issues with the restricted gene flow because the populations are scattered throughout the oceans and aren't mating outside of their populations. Um, again, migration is a big one to help with um, genetic diversity, and these all of Ridley turtles aren't really like uh, mixing with each other, and so we're having low genetic diversity throughout the whole uh, population. And then hawksbills hawk have low diversity overall, so both maternal and paternal, which means that their species is most likely um, seriously suffering. And then green turtles have a high genetic diversity. And here's the pictures again. Also, um, I just want to say that leatherbacks are about two meters long, so if you see the people in the background, like, they're huge. <laughs> Um, and then these are the guys that I worked with in Mexico that I really enjoyed, um, and I learned a lot from them. And that is the end. Um, I do want to thank Fran. She really helped me uh, with kind of redirecting after uh, my experiment kind of fell through. So I'm really uh, glad about that, and thank you so much for that. Um, and then I'd like to thank you to Cash for even giving me the opportunity to work on a sea turtle camp. It was a great experience and once in a lifetime. So. Thank you.
back up here and we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, so um, in about the beginning of July, I flew to Mexico and worked with Sergio, the professor at Unicatch. Um, first thing I did was basically go straight to the turtle camp, and I stayed there for six weeks. Um, I worked on various uh, tasks with them, so I helped like some of the ladies in the morning pick up trash on the beach. I helped late at night, so we'd go all night from like 9 p.m. all the way to about 6 a.m. on the back of uh, four-wheelers, just going along the beach and trying to find nests. Um, so I actually would like personally get close and I watched multiple uh, all of the turtles like give birth. Um, and then in that, we would collect all of these eggs, we would make sure that they were counted for, um, and that we knew how, what the survival rates of these eggs were. Um, and then we'd go place them back into a hole um, back at the conservation camp and uh, basically let them hatch. And then once they hatch, we have to go back in, count all the decomposing eggs versus the actual hatchlings. And then we would release those turtles back into the wild. Uh, and then we also, right when I got there, they had just found an injured turtle. Um, and so we were kind of working with that as well. Um, and for the hatchlings, what I did is I took all the deceased hatchlings that did not survive um, the nesting process and I took their blood and I started to um, do DNA extraction and PCR, I just couldn't finish it, uh, so that I could actually look at genetic diversity of, of, of all of Ridley turtles. Um, and because of that, uh, we could be, be able to give our that conservation camp a little bit more insight on what they're like, uh, conservation efforts work. Let's give our presenters one more round of applause. 